This week's Remarkable People podcast features a woman who fell in love with the Monterey Bay while studying science at UC Santa Cruz. On many dark, dank, and cold mornings, Julie Packard waded through the icy waters of the intertidal zone to study the plants and animals. She did this as research about the impact of humans on the Central California coast. In the late 70s, David Packard, half of the founding team of Hewlett Packard, challenged his children to come up with a big project that would make a difference in the world. Julie's sister Nancy, Nancy's husband, and a couple of friends came up with the concept of an aquarium. Eventually, this led to her father and mother investing $55 million to fund what is now the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Initial studies projected 350,000 visitors a year. Year one drew 2.4 million people. Since its opening day on October 20th, 1984, the Monterey Bay Aquarium has introduced over 60 million people to the incredible sea life off the Central California coast, as well as the vast ocean beyond. Julie is the executive director of the Monterey Bay Aquarium and an international leader in the field of ocean conservation. She is also a leading voice for science-based policy reform in support of a healthy ocean. Can you guess what sea animal she'd like to come back as? Stay tuned and you'll soon find out. Her philosophy is to learn something every day, work with great people, and motivate them to make the world a better place. This is Guy Kawasaki, and this is the Remarkable People Podcast. And now, here's Julie Packard. For me, and I think many people, 367 Addison is the center of the universe. It's like where time began. And you didn't live there? No, I'm so sorry to say. <laughs> that is Mecca, a shrine to the tech community for sure. But my three older siblings were born there. But by the time I came around, my dad had decided he wanted to move up into the hills. So he was born in Pueblo, Colorado, in a really rural town. I don't know if any of the listeners have been to Pueblo, but there's not a whole lot going on. It's right at the edge of the prairie. Um, in Colorado, and he was just super outdoorsy, and I secretly wanted to be a farmer rancher, I think, before he, you know, became an engineering genius. And so they moved from Palo Alto up to Los Altos Hills in the 50s, and then where I was born. So no, sadly, I didn't live at Addison. I don't have any stories. You'd have to interview my older siblings for that. (laughs) But still, you did grow up in the family that arguably started Silicon Valley. So what was that like? Things were very different back then. First of all, just setting the scene. We, we moved up in the hills, in Los Altos Hills, kind of above what's now Foothill College. And back then, it was just apricot orchards and oak forests. And you look out over the valley, there was, of course, hardly any urbanization at all. And so it was very rural and a lot quieter back then, of course. And growing up, probably like most kids in the 50s, my dad worked all the time, no surprise. And my mother was very traditional. And there were four of us in the family. And for her, it was about being being supportive, raising your kids with manners and good values and but we had a great place to grow up my dad bought this apricot orchard and we spent our summers in the orchard cutting the apricots to make dried apricots to sell (laughs) so my dad as i said loved vegetable gardening and growing stuff he he was a huge nature lover but it had to be functional hunting fishing growing things cattle ranching. He loved driving tractors. He'd get out in the tractor and like disc the orchard every spring and drive the tractor around and in the summer apricots would be harvested and we'd sell them to the canneries. Back then, Santa Clara Valley, there were all the apricot and prune and cherry orchards. So there were canneries down there. You'd sell the fresh fruit. Then over time, of course, it was all urbanized, but we still continued to cut dried apricots, sun-dried dried apricots, blenheims, the best. You can get them at the farmer's markets now. That is an insider tip to everyone in California. Look for the Blenheim apricots. They're the best. This is the farmer's market on Sunday? No, just any mm. farmer's market oh. in the Bay Area. You can find them. They're the old school kind that okay. used to grow <laughs> in the Valley of the Heart's Delight, which is what they called Santa Clara Valley, because great fruit growing. 
So my dad worked a lot and he was very imposing. He needed to maintain a little profile at the dinner table and he'd always win every argument. <laughs> you. I mean, many of us, I'm sure, grew up in families like that. He just had such huge curiosity and just seemed to know everything about everything and what he didn't know he would read. He just had an incredible library of just the biggest array of subject matter from calculating plumbing pipes for his irrigation system to the future of the defense industry in Russia. He didn't, did he come home and say, oh, today we got an order for 10,000 oscilloscopes from Disney and, you know, nothing like that? We you, ju know, you know, we I just invented reverse Polish notation calculators, nothing like that? He would tell us about all those things, and we thought they were, like, very exciting and remarkable. We knew all those things were a very big deal, for sure. For me personally, though, you have to understand, I came of age in the 60s, and that was a time when there was just a lot of unrest, a lot of protesting about the military-industrial complex, and HP was a big defense contractor. And so I, I personally always tried to maintain a really low profile about kind of, at the time, my dad's company, because of the political times, you know, there was controversy around it. Now tech is sort of just revered as yeah. everyone's in love with it, but well, well, other than, so much. Other than Facebook, maybe. Yeah, not, not so much. <laughs> but I mean, generally speaking, you know, those were very, very unsettled very unsettled, interesting times, but yeah, my dad would share all those things and would they just blow us away. They were like so cool. Did it ever come to a point where you were philosophically opposed to saying, Dad, how can your company empower the military the industrial complex? Me, personally? Yeah. I, it, well, absolutely. I was the youngest, youngest in the family and definitely a bit of the black sheep and how would I say it? Between the times and being the youngest, I think, and just being very independent. Sure, I had those thoughts, but you didn't take my dad on about things. <laughs> there was no, then nothing, no good could come of it. Really? Let's just yeah. say that. What, what, do you have any particular lessons you look back? Like I can tell you what I learned from my father. The three or four most important things. You have a small number of things you can say, well, my father really ain't. Yeah, absolutely. My dad was incredibly humble. I mean, arrogance was considered in our family the absolute worst quality. So we always were taught, and he modeled that we were very fortunate and we needed to be humble about that and, you know, not, and not ever be arrogant in, in any way, um, not just having to do with money, but just in general the privileges that we had, of course, which he created for the family. <laughs> that was a big family value. Giving back, certainly, because my parents established their family foundation early on. It was in the 60s, mid 1965, the Packard Foundation is now 50 years old. And so early on, they established a family foundation and began supporting, at first, community projects. And the company was always very very supportive and giving back to the community. In fact, my dad was an early supporter of the whole idea of corporate philanthropy, which, in my opinion, still has a long way to go. If he were alive, he'd still be out there proselytizing about that, that companies need to reinvest in their communities. And so he believed that, and my mother actually ran the foundation early on as a volunteer and was very involved as a community volunteer. So that was modeled for us majorly the idea of, of giving back and engaging in your community. I thought she had a full-time job growing up, honestly, and she didn't. She was a full-time volunteer, but she was always gone all day, or I'd be in the parking lot in the car while she was volunteering on some board for the children's hospital or something like this. So what did you learn from her? Well, very similar values to my dad, really. She was quite proper. She was a city girl. She wasn't an outdoorsy nature lover like my dad. She grew up in San Francisco and went to Catholic school and was very refined and, and we needed to reflect well on our father at all times and you know, have, have, have good manners and 
be presentable like any mother. I mean, I don't know that that's kind of mother yeah. mother job description 101, isn't yeah. it? So so those were those were two things I think the okay. the humility and and the giving back. The the final thing I'd say about my dad, he would listen to anyone. I mean, his HP's management by wandering around mm -hmm. that he wrote about in his book, The HP Way, of course, is um, an, an, an epic philosophy in the, in yes. the management literature. And his door was truly always open. And he liked talking to an employee at the lowest level in, in the company as, as much as, or even actually more than <laughs> at a higher level. To be honest, he just loved getting getting in and talking talking to the team about what project they were working on, and he really did the the whole idea of investing in people and, and giving them rain to do their best work, which was an HP philosophy. It's also a philosophy of our family foundation is investing people in their ideas, and he he really modeled that. Now let's talk about the genesis of the aquarium. How did that come to be? The aquarium was the brainchild of my sister and her husband and a couple of their colleagues. So here's how the story happened. So the Family Foundation, the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, we were founded in the mid 60s and, and the four of us children were asked to be on the board, instructed to be on the board. When we turned 21, so uh, the foundation was funding a lot of different programs in different areas, and my father kind of challenged the group, hey, let's think of some, some big projects that we can do that are really all our own rather than just funding other people's ideas. And it was my older sister Nancy and, and as I said, her husband and, and a couple of their friends that were involved with teaching and research down at Stanford's Marine Lab Hopkins Marine Station or Marine Laboratories in Pacific Grove. And Stanford had purchased this big old cannery right next door, the Hobden Cannery, where the aquarium's now located. And they didn't really have plans for it. It was just to buffer zone for develop, all the development in Cannery Row. And they, they had the idea that this would be just a super cool thing to do with this old cannery. And that in Monterey, there was no place for all the tourists to learn anything about the bay, and yet that's why they came there. And we're all marine biologists. They, the four of them were invertebrate zoologists, and I studied marine algae. So none of us were fish people or marine mammal people, but we had fallen in love with the ocean and marine biology because of Monterey Bay, and, and this bay was just an inspiration. It's an amazing place. It's amazing, rich biodiversity. And so we put together a proposal to the foundation to do feasibility study. If an aquarium was built on the site, could it be financially self-supporting based on admission fees and would there be enough attendance to support it? And that came out with a, with a yes. And so with that, we incorporated a new foundation, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Foundation, to plan, build, and operate this aquarium. My parents put up the, the capital, $55 million, to build it, and um, the deal was it had to operate on its own. And we proceeded to put together a board of local, local community leaders and scientists from around. We have such an amazing scientific community here around the Bay, science leaders and family members, and hired architects and exhibit design consultants and a crazy array of specialized consulting help that you need to put together an esoteric kind of institution like an aquarium and set ourselves to, to planning this aquarium. And the concept ha remained the same from the start, which was to do a tour of Monterey Bay habitats and kind of have that be a theme. And a few ideas about the aquarium were different than other aquariums before. One, first of all, most aquariums are rows and rows of fish tanks. Certainly they were at the time, and we're like, that's not what the ocean's like. Fish are just a little tiny part of what the ocean's like. And so we want to really share the, the whole picture. 
number one, and we want to share it in a way where, where the plants and animals are represented as they would be in nature, meaning in communities, kelp forest or a rocky reef or a sandy seafloor. Of course, we have this amazing site with the real thing outdoors, which really no other aquarium has a site that fabulous. Most aquariums are in the dark when you think about it. You're in the dark because that actually makes the from an exhibit design standpoint, it makes the, the tanks pop. You know, they're lit, the fish look great, the tanks look great, but I'm like, wow, we got the real thing out here, this wild ocean, so we wanted a design that really, really drew your attention to, to the real thing outdoors and get people out on the decks and then, you know, could come inside and learn about what they had seen or the other way around. And then finally, we really wanted to, well, two other, two other things that were kind of important points about the concept. One was we didn't want people to be on a one-way path. We wanted it to be free choice. You could experience it however you wanted in whatever order you wanted. And then finally we wanted to really incorporate some of the new museum interpretive techniques that were happening at the science museums like Exploratorium and what we all know is interactive exhibits where people are engaged with the learning. And previously a lot of aquariums were really a tank with fish and a label. Here's the name, here's where it's from, here's what it eats. Maybe another little fact or two. And uh, we wanted to just make it a more interesting and engaging experience, have some intera more interactive kind of hands-on interpretations. So those were some of the underlying concepts. And we naively thought we could remodel that old cannery. Wow, I mean, ta that, that talks about the, uh, or, or shows the sophistication <laughs> level of the group. Said, you know, ask us about marine algal ecology and we can nail it. Anyway, we're like, we're going to remodel this cool old building. The building was uh, built in 1916. It was, I believe, the largest cannery on Cannery Row. But those canneries were just, I mean, it was such a boom and bust thing. And they'd make it, they were just canning, you know, harvesting and canning just, you know, tens of millions of tons of sardines. And they'd add on to their buildings, I'd have a good year, and then things would go along. And I mean, they were just, you can still see, sadly not many, but you can still some remnants, see some remnants in Canary Row of some of those old buildings. So we wanted to, we thought we could remodel the building. Of course, we were quickly disabused of that notion by the architects and engineers, but we were really happy with the concept the architects came up with, which really was preserving the, the facade on Canary Row of that old building. And we kept the old boilers are still a history exhibit when you go in the aquarium. And it turns out Newt Hovden, who was the owner of the cannery, was known to be an incredible innovator and kind of like my dad. He invented a lot of new technology for sardine canning to make it go faster and to make the product better. One of which was to, he had a seawater system, a seawater intake line that went into that building just like the aquarium does. So that was kind of a cool thing. And the idea was instead of have all the sardine boats like offload the sardines at the dock where they start rotting and they're not fresh. And then you have this giant pile of sardines hit the cannery and it's a big processing logistics problem. Um, he came up with the idea of these floating giant wooden boxes they called sardine hoppers. They're offshore and connected to a seawater intake pipe and they'd offload the sardines out there, they'd stay all fresh, and then they'd like suck them into the building as they needed them to um, can them. So he, the building actually was registered on what's called the Historic American Engineering Record. We had to document all of his canning technology. So that's, that's a little backstory about the site of the aquarium, which is amazing. And so that was the, the creation story, and it was about seven years between the time of the idea and the feasibility study and then all the design. It took a really long time to get the permits. That was a lot of drama because we, the city, a city limit line between Monterey and Pacific Grove runs right through the aquarium site, which of course just complicated matters. And we had the Coastal Commission and the Army Corps of Engineers and just a lot of agency engagement. But then we, yeah, we opened did October anybody, 20th. Did anybody fight it? Well. Uh, that would be a whole nother long story. Yeah, we got engaged in some opposition that was really around 
local politics around land use planning decisions that were coming down at the time. They didn't have to do with the merits of the project. Everyone thought the project sounded great. What a gift to the community. Most public aquariums are on city property or they're funded by the city or they're partially funded by the city or, or they get an operating subsidy. So we're just, hello, we're going to pay for this site. We're going to provide the capital to build this building. We're not asking you for any operating subsidy. We're asking you for the aquarium visitor to be part of the parking district, which is a gold mine for the city. And so, yeah, we, we had opposition, but that's a whole other story. It was just local ha politics. Has it evolved from an aquarium to more cause orientation? Absolutely. We, we're just celebrating 35 years this year. And... We had a huge evolution in our mission, which is actually um, reflected in our mission statement. So when we began, the purpose statement for the Monterey Bay Aquarium was something like to expand public awareness, conduct research, and maybe have promote stewardship in there of Monterey Bay. And, and what happened over time, as we all know, is the ocean changed and our understanding of of what was happening in the ocean has has undergone a a transformation not a big enough transformation in terms of public awareness but 30 years ago everyone still thought the ocean was so vast that nothing could possibly affect it and and as our stories that we're telling about the bay and the ocean at large continued to, to evolve and, and stay up with the times, we, we realized that we um, really wanted and needed, it was really imperative for us to start talking more and more about the human impact stories of what was happening on the ocean and not just the, the happy natural history stories about the cool fish and their weird habits, which is great. Obviously, that's what gets people to come in the door and fall in love with the animals and gets their attention, but we needed to to add on a new species to the aquarium interpretation, which was humans. Because the original aquarium, we didn't really have humans so much as part of the story. So we, over time, like kind of transformed all of our interpretation to have more human impact, human stories, more conservation stories, and then eventually decided to do an exhibit called Fishing for Solutions, What's the Catch, that we did in the mid-90s, right after we had opened our open sea wing and, and taken our story offshore to connect with the, the broader ocean. And Fishing for Solutions, you know, we thought, okay, the situation in the ocean is getting dire. We need to do an exhibit about global fisheries and all the problems. And we did that exhibit. And in the course of it, we decided that we need better get our restaurant menu, seafood, item list in shape or it would not look good. And from that whole effort, the Seafood Watch program was mm -hmm. spawned, so to speak. Seafood Watch began as a, just a consumer guide to enable people to know the sustainability of the seafood on their plates. And, and, and around that time, then we realized this, this was really a, a big deal. It really, it really picked up. And, and with that, around that time, we decided to make a commitment to grow that program and also to launch to, to launch a real conservation and science work group and, and big effort at the aquarium. And the seafood work is at the centerpiece of that. But with that, we also changed our mission statement, which was a big milestone for us to what it is today, which is the mission of the Monterey Bay Aquarium is to inspire conservation of the ocean. And the idea behind that being that the end game, the end goal of the whole institution and everything we do is about ocean conservation. But that word inspire in there is really important because we're a public institution and, and our, our best asset for, for achieving that goal in the ocean is the aquarium itself. And so our challenge and, and the, the, the beauty of what we do is that we have this amazing institution that inspires people, that can inspire people through connections with living animals and discovering the ocean, the real thing. Um, in a prior life, I was on the board of the Stanford Alumni Association. And we had many a meeting discussing the mission of the Stanford Alumni Association. 
I don't know, it was pulling teeth. And so I'm just curious. Was this something that your board, your trustees, you all got together and said, let's do this? Or did you bring in McKinsey and they charge you five million bucks to get that <laughs> sentence? So how did that go down? Like with most things, probably it's the theme in your uh, podcast here, if you're talking to, to leaders, is it really came down to, to leadership. It came down to me. I'm like front and center, all conservation, all the time. I mean, that's what motivates me. That's how I... It's my lens in life because of my life experience growing up. And so our board, when I sat in, and our team too, I mean, I think that our team was, hey, Julie, like, you're wanting us to do more and more of this conservation stuff, and it's getting to where we need to really make it official and do something, kind of codify it more. And, and also because for the team, the main activities of the aquarium, we've got the public side, the, the aquarium, the, vi the visitor experience. We've got all of our K-12 education programs. And then we have research, which again is mainly conducted by the by Ambari, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. But we just really needed to restate what is the priority here. And so the board got that. Some of the people were like absolute advocates like, helping me push that through. <laughs> A couple were a couple of the more business oriented ones were a little concerned that okay, is this gonna sound like we're gonna become an advocacy organization, it sound like NRDC or some super lefty conservation environmental agitators? And of course we're not and we didn't intend to do that, but there was a, a little bit of concern about what does this mean? Or what are the optics of this? But in the end the people around the table were, who can, you, you kind of can't argue with, okay, the, the ocean, the things are getting dire. We have this huge power to inform and engage and ignite the public. And, and from our team's perspective, that is the end goal. What, what's the outcome goal? Like everything we do, um, sure, we're a lot of the education programs, Sure, we're improving STEM education and we're con concerned about, we're doing a lot of things, but we just, we needed to provide focus. It, it, one of my favorite things about the aquarium is the fact that we are viewed as nonpartisan. Like everyone loves bringing their kids to a zoo or an aquarium. It's a happy thing. No matter, you might be the most right wing Republican known to humanity or super lefty, but you're comfortable. We, we want the aquarium to be a comfortable place for everyone to come and have a great day. And so we, we need to continue to be that place that's open to all. And, and I'm most excited about reaching the people that maybe haven't thought about the ocean and, and the importance of engaging in the actions that we need to take to ensure that it's healthy for the future, for the benefit of humanity. The people that already are Sierra Club members, some kind of like that's fine, but they're already there. My, my goal is to get them to realize the ocean. If you care about saving nature, you need to talk about the ocean because the ocean is the biggest part of nature. And that's where we, being land-dwelling species, the, the whole environmental movement is so much focused on land as it should and as is understandable, but uh, the ocean has got it, profound influence on everything else. And no one has ever made the case, well, if you're, if you're listing of the right kind of seafood and all that, you're affecting jobs and not, not like we need coal because there's 50,000 coal miners. Interestingly, the Seafood Watch program, which now is a global program, it's a global fisheries and aquaculture program, we are super business friendly and we, in, in the continuum of of organizations working on this issue of overfishing, which is a serious problem and it's something that we can, we know how to fix. I mean, that's that's the reason to work on it. You might think, oh, seafood, whatever, like what about plastic and climate change and all of that? And we can talk about those things. But the thing about fishing is it's the most ancient relationship that humans have with the ocean. It's the only place where we're still extracting, at least certainly the industrialized world is still extracting wildlife 
on a market basis. We think it's fine for people to be fishing and we're here to help transform the seafood and aquaculture business enterprise to one that can be more sustainable into the future. We, get, we take heat from environmental groups and certainly, you know, and, and we take heat from business. We used to take mostly heat from business early on, as you said, because they're like, hey, you're saying now that the Patagonian toothfish is on the Seafood Watch avoid list and we think that's unfair. The whole point is we're like, okay, well, come meet with us. If you fix these two problems, next time around you'll get a better rating so it's been a huge driver i mean businesses really pay attention to it what their rating is it's quite fascinating and become much more powerful than we thought but what would an environmentalist say against you Oh well, that we are too friendly to fishing, and that oh, we should become ve- that we should all become food. vegans. Yeah, and we shouldn't eat any seafood. And you don't believe that? Well, no. I think that would be great for nature. I think it's, and I, I think it's not. I just tend to go for more practical solutions, and I feel like there's big money in in the seafood enterprise. I mean, two points. One. It's big business. It's not going away anytime soon. So let's work to make it better. It is jobs. It, it's a, like millions of jobs in mainly in developing countries. And aquaculture is growing like gangbusters and it provides jobs. It's food security. If we can do it right, it's not going away. If we can do it right, let's, let's, Let's go for it. Let's work to have that all happen in a better way. And as far as catching wild fish, fisheries are resilient. And and as it turns out, if you lay off them when they've been overfished, they will recover. Now, in the big scheme of things, is the ocean a lot more depauperate than it was 200 years ago? Yes, it is. And so for those who say, well, in the best of all worlds, humans would quit extracting any life out of the ocean yeah sure that would be that would be wonderful i mean something like i don't know like over a billion people depend on seafood for their primary protein there's a big food security question here (laughs) and and livelihoods of millions of people in, in coastal economies and i guess on top of it you have countries where people are moving up in the middle class and it is really increasing demand for beef and meat and that's a whole nother I think really worthy consideration to say hey if the world ate less animal protein it would have really positive impacts on climate and a lot of other things I, I don't argue with those points of view I think it's I think that's all true well, we're just focusing on the, the seafood situation and making a lot of progress it's quite it's quite remarkable. There's a lot more to do, though. How do you audit or determine what's on that seafood watch list? Do you depend on other researchers, or do you do first-hand research? So the Seafood Watch rating system is based on published, available research. Okay. People get confused about it. It's not a third-party certified audited program. So it's not, if you go into your Safeway and there's a piece of fish there, it's not going to say, okay, we have, this fish is a piece of halibut and we've, well, first of all, any fish caught in the U.S. is always a good choice these days. It didn't used to be, but if you want to really play it safe, buy something caught in the U.S. fishery because at least we have regulations and and even our fisheries that were depleted, they're, they're recovering. In some cases, it's going to take a long time. But that piece of fish in the store that you're buying that has a Seafood Watch rating of yellow or green, it means that we have evaluated against the set of criteria that I can talk about the sustainability of that particular fish, like how the Alaskan halibut fishery, as an example. It doesn't say that we know that that piece of halibut 
is a piece of halibut, and it doesn't say that we know that that piece of halibut came from Alaska, because that would require that we are doing an audit program. Mm -hmm. Now, there is a program that does that. That's called the Marine Stewardship Council, which is the, the next level. Seafood Watch is just a set of standards for businesses and fisheries to aspire to, and it's an involuntary program. We rate all these fisheries whether you want us to or not. So it's just their transparent bunch of ratings about sustainability of these different fisheries. Marine Stewardship Council was an organization started by World Wildlife Fund and Unilever, I don't know, over 20 years ago that, that does provide third-party certification and they have their criteria. And if you're MSC certified, it means that your fishery has met the sustainability criteria and you've been inspected to, and, and you're reporting back, and the third party certifier is saying, yeah, you are, and you have to get recertified every five years. Okay. It's complicated. So it's all you need what? to know about it for the moment. But I'm always happy to talk more about it. I think it's fascinating, but I'm kind of a, a nerd on the topic. Because it's making so much progress, it's really exciting. I mean, there's just a lot of good stuff, a lot of good stuff going on. You seem excited and optimistic, whereas you read this gigantic Pacific Island plastic patch. What is the greatest threat uh, well, to the ocean? Well, the greatest threat to the ocean... It, um, no surprise, um, carbon pollution, climate change, climate crisis, whatever the current lingo is for it. I mean, clearly, it's, it's like the mother of all environmental issues. You know, like any environmental issue that you can think of, 20 years ago, whatever we said the problem was, now, like, oh, it, cause it's just like an existential threat. And, and when it comes to the ocean... Obviously, we read about sea level rise, which, of course, mainly people are focusing on whether their home's going to be inundated, which is a serious problem to consider. There's a tremendous amount of coastal habitat that contains a huge amount of biodiversity that is changing and is going to be, continue to be altered and just affects entire ecosystems that we can't even imagine. But the big threat that people are just beginning to talk about, which is just insanely concerning is the whole ocean acidification thing, which is as CO2 goes in the ocean water, it makes it more acidic, and those changes are happening already, and as the water becomes more acidic, it's just going to cause, it already is causing changes in whether from, from animals big to small that have, that, that have calcium in their and their cell walls and their shells that can't form, but also just physiological systems that we, we don't even, we're just beginning to understand what those might be. So that's going to have profound effect. And then the ocean warming, which is already happening. And of course, we're experiencing that right here in our part of the world in the central coast. Scientists have documented species shifts where we see more southerly species living up here than we did 20 years ago, just in my lifetime since I've been out in the tide pools doing research and collecting algae and, and looking at animals. So that's, that's happening. And so that climate change is a huge deal and um, sort of the mother, the mother of all issues. I mean, whether it's coral bleaching or impacts of warm water the whole ocean, the whole ocean food web, and the, the one thing about it that most people don't know is the ocean is really. I, I've started to talk about the ocean as our best, healthy ocean as our best defense against damaging climate change, and the reason is the ocean has, the ocean has absorbed something like ninety percent of the heat generated from burning fossil fuels since the industrial revolution. I mean, think about that. The ocean is like a giant modulator of heat in the atmosphere and the whole um, global system, number one. Then number two, all the plant life, the little microscopic plankton plants that live in the ocean are photosynthesizing and sucking up CO2, and the ocean absorbs something like 25% of the carbon emissions, and, and that's huge too. And 
that all happens because of a living ocean. I mean, all of that <laughs> CO2 uptake by those tiny plants, if the ocean's dead, that's not happening. And that, that's pretty much the end of life on the planet, not to be a downer, but it's big. It's really big. Of course, also the ocean plants produce a lot of oxygen, and a lot of that is consumed by life in the ocean, but it, it's... It is a, va a vast part of the of the system that makes life uh, life able to exist on Earth. So, if if a random person is listening to this podcast and thinking, "Oh my God, I believe it, I buy it," everything you just said, what can one person do? N not not in charge of a foundation. I think, of course, I'm asked that a lot, and our over two million people that come to the Monterey Bay Aquarium every year, they definitely ask us that all the time. Wow, okay, I love the ocean, I love these animals, I want my grandkids to see them, and I want us all to, I want humanity to be, to survive and thrive as long as we can on this planet. You know, what, what can I do? And I've, I answer that question in, in, in a couple of ways. I mean, first of all, just get engaged in, in, in the process and of political action, you know, in your community, in your state, in your nation. People need to get out and engage and get the right people in charge of these decisions because our environment is, is a common. It's something that, that society needs to decide together for the benefit of everyone you know, what the rules are. And we, the way we've been operating, there's a lot of, there's just a huge amount of extracting of resources and damaging of ecosystem services that we, that, that, that we all depend on. And change happens, start local. That's where the change begins. And in these days, certainly in the U.S., where I know people are probably feeling rather deflated about how much leadership we can provide and we feel like we're losing ground, which we are in terms of of a lot of the excellent environmental protections. The good news here in the U.S. is a lot of great stuff's happening at the state level. California, for example, the best thing anyone living in California right now can do is support our state or wherever your state is, support its leadership because what's happened here in California, whether it's the progressive environmental policy. I mean, we've always led the way in environmental policies here in, in our state, and it hasn't exactly been at the cost of our economy, by the way. <laughs> I mean, tourism and the tech sector, like, huge. And, of course, tourism depends on taking care of your environment. And all of that's happened because voters care, and they, they voted. They put the right people in office. They supported huge public funding initiatives. I mean, we've had these like $5 billion land and water protection bond initiatives in California to, we've created the first first and only integrated network of marine protected areas in California state waters. Like that was a first in the U.S., anywhere. We have an incredible network of protected lands, protected coastal lands, People drive from San Francisco to LA and they're always kind of shocked. You, you have almost 40 million people living here in the state and this looks so great. And, and Monterey Bay itself, the Central Coast, is totally reviving and thriving. We had, when BBC came out, or decided, they were looking at doing a live broadcast about the ocean, Big Blue Live, and they picked of all the places in the world, they picked Monterey Bay to do this live nature broadcast, which was, fantastic. I mean, we had like whales and white sharks and everything under the sun. So I say get involved in your community uh, to support support policies. And well, and that's, that's the best thing that you can do. And of course, changes in your personal life. I would say the whole seafood movement and the improvement in sustainable seafood, it's U.S. consumers making the right choice has driven a huge amount of business change. And that that really makes a difference. And the same thing can happen with, with plastic, too. I know everyone's very concerned about that. And over time, if people start showing, okay, we really don't need so much single-use plastic, well, if make a difference. Uh, if I were going to go for a seafood dinner, is there anything I just should not eat? 
because I'm not checking labels as the waiter brings out whatever. You should be. You should be checking your seafood watch app. Now, what you need to be looking for in along the restaurant? with along. In the oh, restaurant. you go out to dinner with me. I pull out my <laughs> app. Are you kidding? Oh yeah. Grill the waiter. Actually, the best thing consumers can do. We've done so much public opinion polling about this whole seafood thing. People say, the public says, their best source of information about sustainable seafood is their weight person or the person at the seafood counter. Well, it turns out the weight person usually doesn't know anything. And the only reason, the only way they're going to get to know something is by all of us asking questions. So that's one of the key messages on our Seafood Watch Pocket Guide, ask, ask questions. questions. Ask questions, ask your weight person, where did this fish come from? Is it sustainable and how do you know? And, and they'll tell you. Now, many, many restaurants these days um, in, in coastal states, certainly in the West Coast states, definitely not in the inland states and, and probably less so in the East Coast coastal states. Restaurants will refer to, they'll use it as a, as a sales point and, and they'll say, our seafood is sustainable per Monterey Bay Aquarium guidelines, but you're safe with the things caught in the U.S. pretty much pretty much are okay. And local fish, local U.S. fish, like we've been really promoting our, all of our ground fish fisheries here in California are reopened after being declared a federal disaster and being closed for over a decade. Ask what the local fish is if you're in the U.S. and you'll be good. Here that means like rockfish and lingcod, but it, bass, Isn't it counterintuitive you're saying, okay, so oh, we want to preserve the ocean, preserve wildlife, so wouldn't that say, well, don't eat from local fisheries because they're f fishing right here and reducing our population right here? Well, the important thing isn't whether it's right here. The important thing is, does it have good regulation? Okay. That's the thing. And, and one thing I will say, because the whole eat local movement, which we are all aware of, certainly in our part of the world um, here in Santa Cruz, California, Okay, here's the crazy thing. The United States imports 80% of the seafood we eat and we export 90% of the seafood that we catch. Makes no sense. So yeah, if you go yeah. to a restaurant in the US, <laughs> yeah. chances are the fish did not come from here. It came from another country. Because in the US, the US market, which is, we're, I think the third biggest market for seafood in the world now. So even though you and I might think, how often do we eat seafood? Americans eat a lot of seafood and we, we're a big driver in the global seafood market. Biggest thing Americans eat, shrimp, farm shrimp, farm salmon. And so both of those products are really bad news in terms of the environment and are team at the aquarium is working hard to improve to improve standards and so that's an, that's another story because those are both farm products one of the things that's been really tough on all of our local fishing communities along the coast of the US is all this imported seafood because no one's buying local seafood anymore they don't you, it's, there's not even a distribution system to be honest it's crazy that's starting to change so the more people that the eat local is a really good thing for, for people to ask and, about. And, and what's wrong with farmed? Farm can be fine. It's just the way it's happening now is bad news. And the main things are salmon farms use a lot of antibiotics. That's a huge issue. They create a lot of fish waste in a really concentrated area. Can be equivalent to like a raw sewage outfall of the mid-sized city in one spot, and so that can create a dead zone like in the area. The farm salmon, they get diseases that people are concerned can spread to wild salmon in areas where wild salmon exist. In some areas, that's not an issue if wild salmon don't exist there. And the fish can escape and breed with a wild fish okay. and pollute the gene pool. If there is another life, <laughs> What would you want to come back as? What animal? Or Another plant? Or <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, well, if it includes plants, that's a problem because I'm a, I'm a botanist. But 
I'm going to stick with animal. My favorite fish is this crazy fish called, it's called Mola Mola, the Latin name. It's an ocean sunfish. People who come to the aquarium, if you go to the big open sea exhibit, you'll recognize it. It can grow to be the size of a Volkswagen bug. It looks like a big dinner plate with a fin sticking up off the top and the bottom. It's the world's largest bony fish. I'm a huge fan for a lot of reasons. One, it is it has no commercial value. So like no one seems to care about this poor fish. We have myriad scientific research papers on tunas and sharks, the stuff we like to eat and the scary stuff. This mola, which is like the coolest looking animal ever, like no data whatsoever. The aquarium, we're doing some tagging studies. Nothing likes to eat it. It's got really thick skin. It doesn't taste good, which is, that's what I want, who I want to be. Like I mean, <laughs> animals are going to leave me. No one's going to be after me. If I'm a 2,000 pound mola, right, I'm pretty safe, even though I swim really slowly. I can't keep up, I can't get out of the way, I just grow big really fast. Then, the other thing is, I eat jellyfish, jellies. So the future ocean, a lot of the scientists are saying that one really doom and gloom scientist saying the future ocean will be a world of slime. Okay, so what that means is the oxygen the oxygen levels in the ocean are declining over time. These layers of these oxygen minimum layers, they call them. Jellies have super low metabolism and they can live in really funky conditions. So whatever happens in the ocean... You have I, lots to eat. I've got lots to eat. And I can swim to my preferred water temperature zone if the ocean temperature changes. So I'm thinking like that's maybe the animal to be. What do you want your legacy to be? I am super proud of all that the Monterey Bay Aquarium has accomplished and our team has just taken it so far beyond anything wildly imaginable. I'm just really happy that I've had the opportunity so far and continuing to, to open people's eyes to this, what I like to call the other part of the planet that we've just now woken up to that makes humanity able to exist here on this beautiful earth and if I can if, if I have uh, spark the engagement and, and dedication and motivation of, of a few people whether they're teachers or kids future advocates that will carry on that's that's something that I'll feel okay. really good about but as I did my research on you I, I one of the most interesting things is you are the antithesis of a trust fund baby Right? I mean, but you are the daughter of <laughs> the person who created Silicon Valley, but you're not a trust fund baby. Now, how did that work out? I mean, you're the exception. I get asked that actually by people um, these days who have come on to a lot of success and are raising children, and they're like, wow, you actually are what happened to doing you? <laughs> something productive. How did that happen? And I mean, all I can say about it, it's really about how about what kind of parents we are and, and how, and it's not what we say, it's who we are and how we lead our lives. And that's the most important thing. And my parents, they were all about um, being productive, contributing, working hard, even though I grew up in the 50s. And at that time, the women, the girls, I have two sisters, we weren't really expected. My dad had a lot of, lot of expectations placed on my brother, big time expectations. The girls, it was, you've got to do really well in school and work really hard and, and, and give back to society. The, the kind of paying job expectation was a little vague. It was important to find a good husband. Those were the times. Go it, to a good university. It was important to find a good yeah, husband. Yeah, to our mother, yes, yes. Because yeah. those were the times. But my dad, if there was one message I got from him was, don't be a slacker, work hard, all the time at what you were doing and be contributing in some way. Maybe if one of us wanted to take some time off and have children look after the kids for a while, but, but even so, and, and all of us in the family, whether, whether we like go into a job every day or w whatever we're doing, everyone is doing some big projects to 
make the world a better place in some fashion. And that's just because that's what our parents, that's what our parents did. If you're ever anywhere near the Monterey Bay area, you must visit the Monterey Bay Aquarium. It will blow your mind. And now you know about the Mola Mola, specifically that it eats jellyfish, which is likely to be in good supply. And if you are a Mola Mola, no one's going to want to eat you. If anyone would know what fish to be, it's Julie Packard, Executive Director of the Monterey Bay Aquarium. This is Guy Kawasaki, and this was the Remarkable People Podcast. Thanks to the Remarkable People Podcast team of Jeff C., Peg Fitzpatrick, Marley Morgan, and Neil Pearlberg. They keep my ocean blue and teeming with great content. Special thanks to Kevin Connor and Terry and Will Mayo who made this podcast possible. Finally, special thanks to Michael and Caitlin T. of Crate. They helped me figure out how to recover a corrupted Zoom H6 file. If they hadn't done that, and if I had to tell Julie Packard that I lost the file, and if she had said, tough luck, there would not be this podcast. Thank you, Michael and Caitlin, Jeff, Peg, Marley, Neil, Kevin, Terry, and Will. It takes a village to make a podcast. This is Remarkable People.